Let some more people in as they uh, queue yeah, up well. outside and admit them. Okay, thank you, Aurea. So good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Martin Garrett and I'm Chief Exec at Cambridge Cleantech. And a warm welcome to this event on the first and last mile, adjusting to the new greener normal. So this is the third in a series of three events we've been holding over the last uh, three weeks in uh, November. And we've been doing so in partnership with the Maxwell Centre and Cambridge Zero, uh, both of course parts of the University of uh, Cambridge. All I really wanted to do was to say welcome and just to mention that as Cambridge Cleantech is the membership network for environmental goods and services companies in the region, uh, we do a whole host of these style uh, of events um, over the, the weeks and months. So do take a look at our website to see what's uh, coming up. And in the spirit of that also, uh, next week, I just wanted to mention that we have our Cleantech Venture Week. So we had 120 applications from innovative SMEs to pitch, and they've been whittled down by the judging panel to the 28 most investment ready. That's covering all sorts of topics, um, including future transport, uh, but also looking at the energy transition and sustainability, uh, more generally smart cities, and uh, water innovation. So uh, if you'd like to come along to that, do take a look at our website and we'd be looking forward to welcoming you to that event next week as well. But without any further ado, let me hand straight over to Arga, who's our main contact at the uh, Maxwell Centre. She's going to be your host for this afternoon's session. Arga, over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Arga Vyshikitrovnik. I am Director of Partnership Development at the Maxwell Centre. As Martin already explained, we have collaborated on this event to bring together a lot of people who have um, ideas, insights, knowledge, expertise that is relevant to adjusting to the new greener normal. Um, this slide presents a snapshot of our day. Um, as you can see, we will be starting with a keynote address from Professor John Clarkson, who will be introducing the idea of systems thinking and how uh, this approach can help us with solving acute challenges that we are facing. Um, it will be followed by a series of uh, recorded pitches from companies and organizations that are working on low carbon mobility. I will chair um, plenary question session just after that. I could please ask everybody to type up your questions as they are coming in during our presentations into the chat window and we will make sure to answer some if not all of them in the plenary questions. After which we will part the whole group into smaller um, sub rooms where we would invite everybody to contribute. Um, we have some questions that we might want to help with starting the discussions, but I think please, please feel free to contribute um, as you see fit. After that, we'll come back and the event is intended to close at 2.30. However, we'll probably leave the Zoom call open for a bit longer if conversations are to continue, if there are some people willing to. So um, just a reminder, Please let me computer, there we go. So the think piece is, this is why we're meeting. We would like to um, take holistic approach to this issue. And we've invited a lot of people from various backgrounds and we hope to take account of all of your contributions. Um, just looking in the context of where we started pre-pandemic, what things might need to change. Uh, we will make a summary of it in the document and then maybe think about what next so that we can make some progress towards the ideal future. Um, in particular, we would like this to focus on which challenges, gaps and open questions are remaining in this area. And I think, as you will see, um, there's quite a lot of them. So I think we'll need to do a little bit more of tensioning between the questions, understanding what needs to be tackled first, in which order, who can contribute, what solutions and ideas might be to tackle it, and then maybe hazard some uh, next steps. So this is the third workshop of this series, the last for the current November. We shall see how it goes after here. If there is appetite from many people involved, we might actually reopen the group, maybe revisit in a year or two to see if the progress has been made. Now, today is not the end of it. If, we, uh, if you have some other thoughts or other people and insights to feed into our um, process of building a think piece, please use this email address thinkpiece at maxwell.com.ac.uk to forward any further ideas to us. Um, very, very quickly, housekeeping. Um, I'm sure everybody's familiar with Zoom, but please unmute yourself only when you're trying to speak. Um, we will be recording this session as well as the breakout rooms. Uh, breakout rooms are primarily for us to make sure we capture all your points. 
the, the main session will be made available to Think Peace contributors to review later, if so they wish. Um, if you don't want to feature in the video, please switch off your video uh, feed into the Zoom. And as I mentioned, please feel free to use chat to comment, put questions in, and any other contributions you want captured. With this, without any further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor John Claxon, uh, who is from the Department of Engineering at University of Cambridge and has a huge amount of experience and very, very good ideas about solving problems. John, over to you. Thank you. So I'll just try and make sure I share the right screen. Should be that one, I hope. So I'm a professor of engineering design in the Department of Engineering here at Cambridge. And prior to that, I was working for PA Technology as a technology consultant. And I guess throughout my career, I've become interested in systems and complex systems. But what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is nothing about transport. It's all about healthcare. And I'll tell you the story of what came out of doing work with the Royal Academy of Engineering, chairing a working group with them to see how a systems approach might add value to healthcare design and improvement. And this is on the back of about 30 years of the health and care improvement community saying, maybe we should have taken a systems approach. So finally, we thought maybe we should try and describe what a systems approach is. So I'll tell you the story that came out of that. And hopefully you'll see the parallels from healthcare and the descriptions we came up with and their value within transport. So if I look at what we were set to do, we wanted to work with the health and care professions to explore how engineers can add to current understanding and practice of systems engineering in quality improvement and healthcare design. And the idea is that in a systems approach, systems that work do not just happen. They have to be planned, designed and built. And yet we all know that the world isn't that perfect. Sometimes we start with something, we're trying to change it. We can't plan all of it, but that's the principle. And if we then look to systems engineering as the discipline where some of these ideas might come from, they have the V model, which has been developed over at least 30 years. And it has a classic V shape. The wording on it is very useful in saying what a systems engineering view is. The arrows are drawn in very particular ways and, and communicate the nuances of systems engineering. But the challenge is it's utterly unintelligible to anybody who's not really grown up with that model and try to use it in practice. Now, it's usually at this point that we have to explain to our healthcare colleagues what an engineer is, and that's quite a useful learning process. I'm worried about little Dilbert. He's not like other kids. What do you mean? Yesterday, I left him alone for a minute, and he disassembled the TV, our clock, and the stereo. That's perfectly normal. Kids take things apart. Oh. The part that worries me is he used the components to build a ham radio set. Oh, dear. Is that bad? Normally, I'd want to run an EEG on him, but the machine isn't working. It's worse than I feared. What is it? I'm afraid your son has the knack. The knack? The knack. It's a rare condition characterized by an extreme intuition about all things mechanical and electrical and utter social ineptitude. Can he lead a normal life? No. He'll be an engineer. <laughs> no! <laughs> there, there. So I was diagnosed at least 40 years ago. And I grew up with that V model and realized it wasn't what we wanted to start from. So what we thought we'd do instead is talk about systems design, risk, and people. And we ran workshops with health and care professionals and engineers to try and unpack these different perspectives on a systems approach. So of course, when we talk to healthcare professionals about systems of systems, they get it. They understand the human bodies. It has a waterproofing system, a plumbing system, a digestive system, and so on. And they know that the, the performance of the whole is far greater than the sum of the parts. And they know if some part is not working or some geographical area is damaged, it compromises the whole. But you can look at this in a slightly different way. You might be a patient going to the GP seeking help for some type of medical condition. And you end up with a prescription 
may be generated by computer or from the formulary that you then take to the pharmacist and they have their own delivery and dispensing system. They make sure they give you the right medication with the right information on the bottle so that when you take it home and put it in your system, you know when you should use that medication, take the right medication at the right place in the right time. And then there's the pharmaceutical discovery processes, there's the manufacturing delivery processes. But all of these have to work well to make sure that the patient gets the right medication in the right dose taken at the right time. Despite the fact we conspire to make everything look the same, as you can see in the picture here. And the questions that might come out of that is, well, who are the stakeholders? Who are the people who have an interest in that system? What are the elements or the parts of the system? And how does that system perform when you put it all together? And you could see that as the, the system's perspective of a system's approach. For design, we you go back to the double diamond model from the Design Council. And what that infers is that we should spend at least as much effort trying to understand the need for what it is we're trying to create and translate that into a description of the problem or the challenge as we spend trying to find the best ideas and concepts and solutions to meet that problem and in turn to meet the need. And we can apply that thinking to very simple things like blood pressure monitoring kit, which is used widely in the healthcare system, or it might be a piece of equipment within a suite of equipment used in the complex environment of theatre, and it has to work for the patient to be kept alive. And here we have a, a GE750 scanner for use for children. And the child is promised an undersea adventure. And when they come to the hospital, everybody is in costume, and they take them on this wild adventure where the rumblings of the scanner is put down to the engine room of the submarine. And they're told to lie really still and quiet so nobody knows they're down there. And success is a clear scan image for the child and the child's desperate to come back tomorrow and try it all over again. And here we design the whole experience, not just the piece of equipment. And equally, it might be something like a defibrillator by use for the general public. Not only does it need to work correctly first time, but the information content on that equipment has to be read by a complete novice such as they use it to make it work first time. So we might translate these into questions as to what are the needs, how can the needs be met, and how well are the needs met? And that might be the design questions associated with a systems approach. And then if we talk about risk, and this was the only time we put any engineering like pictures on the page for the healthcare colleagues, you might want an outcome where most outcomes are within the normal spectrum, the center of that curve. And risk assessment is most normally about looking for the threats to that normal behavior, things that might cause the accidents. And how do you spot them and eliminate them? But equally, it's about looking to the other end of the curve and saying, well, what are the things we do exceptionally well? And how do we learn from that opportunity to make the normal more like the exceptional? We're trying to move the whole of that curve to the right. So in healthcare, for example, we've studied central line insertion. And we know there's a particular point in the cycle where if you interrupted this particular operator, they may forget that that wire they're just about to grasp is in or outside of the patient. Now, it generally doesn't kill people, but it's pretty inconvenient to have to go back in and retrieve the wire afterwards. And equally, we know there's a team in Swansea who study infusion pumps. And there's a particular pump, if you're trying to tap in 15.7 and you tap in 15.5, delete seven, you've now tapped in 157. And it looks like you're the one who's made the mistake. When in fact, this equipment is just poorly designed. It doesn't take into account the way people think and operate with the equipment. So when you say, what could possibly go wrong? Well, many things often with badly designed equipment. And equally can apply these principles to people systems. So what could possibly go wrong on the ward when you have a team change, a change in shift? And equally, we need to make sure that we apply this thinking to a system where there might be genuine errors or accidents. So this is Hamilton. I think it's Malaysia 2014. He's just switched from racing for McLaren to racing for Mercedes. He comes storming into the pit, first time in the race, and stops at the McLaren pit. They don't quietly have to wave him on down the line to Mercedes. So it's a genuine mistake. So how do we design systems that are resilient, robust to those sorts of errors? 
So we might be saying, well, what is going on? We need to know what we're looking at. And then this double-ended question, what could go wrong? Or what do we do well? And then how do we make it better? And you can see the, the overlap now between the sort of systems perspective and the design perspective. And then it's about people. And initially we were thinking about diversity in the population. In healthcare, that might be the patient population or the provider population. So thinking on those lines, why would you give somebody who has arthritis medication in a child resistant container, which they can't open? And they have to find coping strategies to get to their medication. And this is the same picture as before, but without your glasses on in the morning, and we've conspired to make everything look the same, but the medication in the, in the top left corner, if you take that daily, you kill yourself horribly, but everything else you take daily. So that one you take weekly, how would you know the difference? And what about the language we use for communication? Is it clear, consistent, comprehensible? We need to think through different people's capabilities. And equally, if we come up with a solution for one ward, one team, might we expect it to be useful on the ward next door in a nearby hospital or nationally? Probably not. And the questions that might arise from this is who will use the system, where is the system, and what affects the system? So we have these four perspectives, and it's a bit like the juggler. The performance is only ever complete if you can keep all four balls in the air, people, systems, design, and risk. And if we put those questions together and a few management questions, we get this natural cycle of questions. And it, it's iterative, but generally the questions on the right-hand side are very much about, well, what is the challenge, the problem, the context? And the questions on the left-hand side are much more about, well, what is the solution and how well does it work? But it is an iterative process. And you're always sort of asking, what should I do next? General observations that came out of this is that people were surprised that engineers think about people. But we spend most of our time thinking about people. We see iteration before implementation. We iterate in our design and systems thinking before we put something into practice. Whereas in healthcare, often they do something then see how well it worked. We see design as an exploratory process, exploring the need to discover the problem and exploring the problem to find the best solution. And we see risk management as a proactive process. What could possibly go wrong? As well as asking the question, well, what went wrong and why? And the reason for using questions is we think that thinking changes practice. We challenge the way people think, but process may help. And I'll come back to that briefly later. And loads of people kept saying to me, John, this is there's nothing new here. It's common sense, it's not rocket science. And while we see islands of excellence in healthcare improvement, common sense is not common. And if I was to distill that right down and say, look, what do I learn from all of this in my years of practice? I'd have to say, well, it's down to two questions. How can we do it better? And what can possibly go wrong? And good engineering, good systems thinking enables us to balance the answer to those two questions well. So just before I close, in engineering, in the engineering world, we have something called the chief engineer. And this is one definition of a chief engineer. The chief engineer at any stage of a project cycle works with and between their teams and the other teams at equal, lower and higher system levels to ensure a smooth technical program with no surprises or adverse consequences. And I think that's a really good quote about the, the helicopter view the systems engineer has to have of the whole system. And we've been taking what we've been learning here and teaching it to healthcare improvers, healthcare professionals, engineers, and significantly policy makers as well. And with the change of a few words, what we might say is that the systems leader at any stage of a policy cycle, works with and between their teams and other teams at equal, lower and higher system levels to ensure a smooth delivery program with no surprises or adverse consequences. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, if you could type any questions that come to your mind into the chat, we will promptly now move to uh, the presentations and. and Elevator pitches. Orian, are you ready? Yes. Hi, everyone. Right. I'll be sharing. Um, I'll be sharing the videos today. So for the speakers who send me the videos, I'll be doing it. Um, I hope that's okay. It's just so it goes. It runs a bit more smoothly. Right. So.
Hello, everyone. Um, can you all see my screen? Yes, we have a folder for the moment. Oh, right, sorry. Hello. Okay. Um. Everybody, my name is Nir. I'm one of the. How's that? Yep. The three co-founders of Chakra Tech. Chakra Tech is boosting immobility e anywhere. We are seeking to replace the experience on the left with this one on the right. We all know that the evil revolution is in the fast end. We see it all around us and it is accelerating. One of the key factors for accelerating the immobility e is, uh, is fast charging. Just understand what is fast charging and how does it look like a number? If, you, if a typical charge of a car is 50 kilowatt hour, which brings him another 300 kilometer distance. And if you have 25 kilowatt grid power, then you would need two, two hours to charge your car. If you would like to charge your car in 10 minutes, then you need 300 kilowatt. This is a lot of power, which is not ever, and everywhere available. And this is the reason why you won't, like, won't find a fast charger here. And if you get stuck in, such, stuck in such a location, then you will need a couple of hours to recharge and go on. So the solution, is a local energy storage, which is actually a local power booster, which is boosting uh, at the point of charge, the fast charger. And just to explain the, the concept, we have some similar device at home, which is doing the same function. It is charging itself slowly while not being used. It's storing the energy in the tank, in the storage tank. And when you need it, then you release the energy fast into your application. So the same concept works out, out also for our, for our application and our technology. This is how a system looks like, and here you see our kinetic and uh, our technology enables here with unlimited charge cycles and uh, sustainable and without degradation over the full lifetime of the project. Another big advantage of our technology, which we are very proud of, is our impact on the global warming potential. And you can see here that in an independent research which was done in Austria, our impact is 23 times smaller than our closest competitor, lithium-ion batteries. <clears throat> These are our projects. We have a project in Austria, in, uh, in uh, the Czech Republic with Škoda Auto, uh, in uh, Italy with Enel. We also have a project in Germany at Premarine, which is an indoor project. Those are three outdoors. We have an indoor project. And we also are working on the project uh, with, for the North American market with Blink in the USA. Uh, looking inside, you see here our batteries. Those are our kinetic batteries. Uh, basically, this is the fast uh, KPB kinetic power booster for fast charging. Uh, this is not all, uh, fast charging is not the only application on, on our system. We are also having energy management system inside. We can do right any additional use cases like a backup power system and many other applications. We were founded in 2013. We are a team of about 20 employees, leading engineers and industry experts, and we have won several prizes. Two of them you can see here. Thank you very much. I invite you to join the ride. We're looking for project partners, distributors, and representatives. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Jean de la Verpillière. I'm the CEO and co founder of Echion Technologies. Echion is a spin out from University, and we develop and commercialize super fast charging batteries. Uh, today, I'm going to give you a short intro to Echion, and I'm going to give you our take on the future of transportation. I'll start by uh, sharing my screen, uh, which you should be able to see right now. All right. Uh, super fast charging batteries and immobility. Um, you like it or not? Uh, in order to meet uh, the net zero emission goals uh, by the end of the decade, we will we'll need improvements in battery technologies. Uh, current uh, conversation around batteries is centered around uh, full electric uh, passenger cars and how they need uh, higher and higher energy density batteries uh, with lower and lower dollar per kilowatt hour cost. Uh, but there's much more to consider. That's, that's the point I want to make today. E-mobility is more than uh, a central cause. You have to consider 
a range of applications from electric bikes, trains, marine applications, commercial electric vehicles like taxi fleets or uh, electric buses, uh, or all the other sorts of uh, individual uh, passenger vehicles in, in urban environments. Uh, and the thing is, uh, all these applications have uh, requirements that are very different from that of a passenger car. Uh, for instance, uh, you can have fast charging, opportunity charging buses, which are buses that uh, charge at the end when they reach the end of the line at the terminal, uh, quick charge and off they go uh, for, for another journey. Uh, so these buses, uh, if, they, if they can fast charge, they could fast charge. Uh, they, uh, you know, it would enable to have buses that are built with much smaller battery packs that you recharge more often, and that it's, uh, that it's more uh, economically sustainable and costs less to build a small, small battery. Uh, it's more efficient, and the impact on the environment is, uh, is smaller. Um, the only problem is uh, current batteries cannot fast charge. Uh, a standard lithium-ion cell uh, takes at least 30 minutes uh, for a partial charge, um, which is simply too long uh, for a number of these applications. Uh, at Echion, we've developed uh, a battery technology which enables six minutes uh, for a full charge and without sacrificing the cycle life of the battery, safety, or its energy density and dollar per kilowatt hour cost. Um, the way we do this is uh, with the materials innovation, we innovate on the anode of the lithium ion battery, which is the component of the battery which stores the electricity uh, when you charge it. We've developed a patented, uh, a new material uh, which enables uh, to do that really well indeed. Um, we have progressed a lot since we spun out of the university in 2017. Uh, we now have a team of, of 20 people. Uh, we're based in Sostad, just outside of Cambridge. Uh, we've developed our product. We've proved that it worked uh, with, uh, with cell manufacturers and, and users. Uh, the materials uh, is being trialed around the world and we're now progressing towards market entry. Um, so uh, I'd like to use uh, this, this ask anyone who, who's watching and think uh, they could help us uh, through collaboration, uh, accelerate our, our market entry to, uh, to please uh, get in touch. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, watching and I hope to speak to you soon. Goodbye. Uh, my name is Pao. Uh, I'm a co-founder and CEO of Robot, and we are a company that focuses on building AI-based 3D printing software solutions. So the technology that we're building is mostly um, perception the edge. So what it means is we have optimized our vision-based 3D printing solution, in particular for low-power embedded systems. And the functionality that we deliver includes object detection, classification, tracking, localization, and depth estimation. And the key is how we optimize for the low power embedded system to achieve cost effectiveness. In terms of our team, so we are resting out from uh, University, University of Cambridge Computer Lab, and we're a team of computer vision, software, robotics, and deep learning experts and researchers. We have raised a seed round from strategic investors, and we have been working with customers and partners um, in the space of um, the digital screen for autonomous vehicles, as well as providing the perception module for uh, customers in commercial and passenger vehicle space. Dive a bit, dive a bit deeper into our technology. Um, so here are some more demonstrations. Here is an example of our 3D sensing software solutions for city reconstruction as well as 3D detection and classification, all running on low power arm based computing software. Moving along, here is a demonstration of our technology working for localization for both indoor and outdoor settings, which could be very challenging for the more traditional GPS dependent method. Moving along, and here is also a demonstration on our work in the 3D estimation, uh, 3D distance estimation uh, method, where you deploy a self-supervised learning approach to 
to obtain input sensory information from just a single and a monocular camera. And here we also apply our optimization method so that a deployment can be run on low power embedded systems as opposed to more power, uh, power hungry uh, computing devices. In terms of some of the current collaboration, so we have Siemens as one of the customers, and we have been uh, deploying our perception software solutions for their pay 360 uh, platform in particular for validating and ver verifying the next generation of uh, autonomous driving uh, electrical and electronic systems. And we've also been working with um, automotive companies uh, in both passenger and commercial vehicle space where we have deployed and uh, trialed our perception demonstration on urban roads. And here we have been offering our perception at the edge, which includes, which includes optimized modules on embedded systems. So if you're a company that's interested in our solution and would like to see more of the demonstration, or like to see how we can incorporate AI-based perception on the edge of your solution, um, feel free to come and talk to, talk to me. And uh, look forward to starting conversation. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to share with you our vision for sustainable micro mobility in Cambridge and beyond. Uh, we currently operate a commuter e bike service in the Cam North Cambridge area for employers who want to encourage staff out of their cars and onto bikes. And we have various pickup and service points uh, around the city. Um, in addition, we operate. Uh, service for North Stow and Feversham in partnership with uh, South Cambridgeshire and with uh, the Cambridgeshire County Council. Uh, we're also operating staff e-bikes at Edinburgh Hospital. We're working with um, Sharebike of Norway and the big issue to launch a, an extensive e-bike service for the Greater Cambridge area from spring next year. However, we believe that uh, cycling is not sufficiently inclusive to be a pervasive travel mode uh, because it excludes the elderly and infirm. It excludes inexperienced cyclists who are insufficiently confident to cycle on crowded roads. Uh, and it is weather dependent for non-hardened cyclists. We find that in the bad weather months, our usage of our service drops dramatically. E-cars are expensive and resource hungry. They perpetuate a non-inclusive uh, transport culture with extensive upstream and downstream carbon footprints and create congestion and particulate emission pollution. We urgently need micromobility solutions to replace car journeys and provide an alternative for commuters who are shunning public service because of uh, epidemic anxiety. Our solution is the CityPod, which is based on e-bike technology and conform, conforming to e-bike regulations. It's an ultra lightweight and agile vehicle. It has three wheel stability. It is highly inclusive for all abilities and ages. It has a high level of safety compared with bicycles because of its safety cell construction. Uh, it is low cost design using off the shelf e-bike components as much as possible. The design brief to Bernie Harper, who is the head of our design, is to develop an all-wheel, all steer, an all-wheel steering, all-wheel drive, full suspension microcar with a narrow track for agility and the ability to lean into bends like a bicycle. A robust construction is required to deliver a target usability period of seven years of and the uh, of fully recyclable components. We've developed a range of partners, contractors, and advisors supporting us in the development of the vehicle. In January, we held a workshop, including several of these, to brainstorm on the vehicle's development. We're currently seeking funding uh, for the development of a prototype for performance and safety testing, as well as user experience research. Thank you very much.
Can anybody hear the presentation? No, I can't hear anything. Uh, no, I can't hear anything. Oriane, would you be able to restart the ZD5, please? Yes, sorry. Good morning, I'm Rob, I'm the CEO of Zetify. Can everyone hear now? Yes, yes but perfect. now it's your folder again, sorry. Is that okay? Can you see it? Yeah, we can see it now. Good morning, I'm Rob. I'm the CEO of Zedify. And I'm here to tell you a little bit about Zedify and also about how we make deliveries in cities better. So I'm standing here in our consolidation hub in Cambridge. And like all our depots around the country, these are situated on the edge of an urban environment, edge of a city. And they act as a gateway for deliveries coming into that city and out of it. So you can see here, we've got a whole load of parcels that have been coming in this morning from some of our partners. Uh, and these are being sorted into delivery routes and delivery rounds uh, by the guys. Um, they'll also be consolidated and added with other items that come in a little bit later with things like magazines, veg boxes and other items. And then the guy's going to go out and they can put them onto their wonderful cargo bikes uh, and do their delivery rounds. But unlike a traditional van courier, these guys are going to be out for just three or four hours. And while they're doing their deliveries, they're also going to be collecting items to come back here for delivery going out later or for consolidation. The key advantage of that and being very close to where we're doing our deliveries is that we can be much more flexible for our customers. We can get in and out really, really quickly um, and we can hit those sort of delivery time windows that our customers want. So these collections could be coming from a variety of different customers. For example, we collect household batteries on behalf of stores like the co-op and they come back here. They get stored in one of the big battery bins here. And that means that a big truck can just turn up once every month, two months when we've got tons of batteries rather than that big truck having to go into the city and pick up lots of small little items on a daily basis. We might also be collecting items from shops that are perhaps going for a national next day delivery. It might be sending some stuff to Scotland. We'll go and collect those parcels, bring them back here from all those different shops where they'll get consolidated. And at the end of the day, DHL or one of our other delivery partners will collect them and they'll go on their onward journey. And of course, that means that that's fewer vans into the city centre. Those delivery vans don't want to be collecting lots of small little items. So a win-win really. And finally, we also obviously do lots of local deliveries as well. So we'll work directly with the shops. We'll go and collect those items. We also work with a fantastic business called Click It Local. Customers can choose lots of different items from different shops on the high street, have all those collected by our couriers. They come back to our depot where they're sorted again, and then they'll go out on a delivery round and the customers will get all of their deliveries consolidated in one. So these are our wonderful cargo bikes. As you can see, they're pretty massive. Um, they, they act like a small van. They are pretty useless at going up and down the motorway and they're pretty useless at uh, rural environments, but they're absolutely fantastic in a city environment. They can access all areas really well. They can get through the traffic much more easily. When they stop at a business, you can um, take out your parcel straight away and don't have to worry about parking. So to tie all these different elements together and make sure that we have offer the best delivery experience for our customers, as well as making it really efficient for our couriers and offering a variety of services, we developed our own technology platform. So whether that's doing an integration with DHL or one of our partners or getting digital proof of delivery to make sure there's real time access for our clients, we tie all of that together to make sure that we can make consolidated deliveries work as a business in terms of reducing emissions, reducing congestion. And essentially that's what drives me and drives all my colleagues to make sure our cities are nicer places to be. Thanks for listening. Okay, next one. Hi, I'm Alex from Flint. We develop lightweight folding e-bikes for commuters. Folding bikes have been helping people to get around flexibly for decades by letting them take their bike with them on public transport or into the office. Meanwhile, e-bikes let people cycle further and more often. Combining the two unlocks the city. This is not a new idea. Adding motors and batteries to folding bikes to boost the pedal power of the rider is tried and tested. But most folding e-bikes take an existing folding design and just add the e-bike bits, leaving you with something the size and weight of the biggest bag you can check in at the airport. That's not a great experience for anyone who's had to haul one of those around public transport. Flit is different because instead of taking a folding bike and making it electric, 
We design bikes to be both folding and electric from scratch, leaving you with an e-bike that is closer to the size and weight of hand luggage. We're proud to call Cambridge our home. We were founded in Cambridge and do all of our R&D work right here in the city. We've already developed and successfully launched our first product, the Flit 16, in a crowdfunding campaign last year. We believe there is a big opportunity in Cambridge for e-bikes to get even more people cycling, thereby reducing congestion and pollution and freeing up space all over the city. Local governments have already shown their recognition that cycling is an effective way of moving people around our city by committing to cycling infrastructure projects like the Cambridge Greenways and the Chisholm Trail. We believe that this can be taken a step further. Flit was recently awarded a six-figure grant by Innovate UK to develop a new type of folding e-bike that is suitable for local assembly and easy maintenance. This makes it ideal for leasing to companies or organisations that want to get more of their employees on bikes. We've had a range of interest expressed so far, including a multi-site employer who would like to give their staff more flexibility in how they get between offices in the city, an estate agent who wants their staff to cycle to property viewings instead of driving, and a company that rebalances vehicle fleets and would like to use an e-bike for last mile journeys so that they don't need to send out two employees in a car for each pickup. If you're an organisation that would be interested in working with us to improve green travel options around Cambridge or you would like to join us on our mission to create the ultimate folding e-bike then please get in touch by emailing alex at flip.bike. Thank you. Okay, and now just the last one. Hi, my name is Roxanne Tebow. I'm the Executive Director of CanCycle, Cambridge Cycling Campaign. We were founded 25 years ago and we now have over 1,550 paid members. We work for more better and safer cycling for all ages and abilities in and around Cambridge. For us, this is about happy, healthy people and a thriving, sustainable region. Cycling benefits everyone, even if they do not ride a bike. We are the cycling capital um, of the UK, but even in Cambridge, there is significant room to improve. We have over 30% of people cycling to work every day, and that's according to the 2011 census, so it's probably a lot more now. Um, and 48% of residents in the region cycle at least once a week. We know that there are already 15% of people who would cycle if things were safer, and 82% of residents, whether they cycle or not, support improvements to cycling infrastructure. So what do we need to get more people cycling? Firstly, we need complete networks. A cycle route is only as good as its weakest link. We need to make sure that all the wonderful cycle lanes we have are joined up um, and meet the right standards so that anyone feels safe when they're cycling. We cannot fail at our junctions. We must have safe junctions where people cycling and walking have separate space, be that through infrastructure and or time, so that they can complete their journeys safely. The Dutch roundabout is one great example. We also have to look at traffic reduction, be that through creating filters where people walking and cycling can go through, but people driving need to go another way, or perhaps we have to be bolder and look at things like demand management through congestion charging. One recent example is the Chisholm Trail, which is on its way. And we're so excited that just the other week, the Chisholm Trail Bridge or the Abbey Chesterton Bridge was lifted into place. This is going to connect communities and make many, many commuting journeys safer and more enjoyable. Recently, we've responded to the pandemic with our Spaces to Breathe campaign, calling for more options for people walking and cycling, particularly for those who no longer can use public transport but also to make sure that we captured that um, pleasant environment that we experienced during the pandemic when there was significantly less traffic on the road. I think we've captured people's imagination now to see that a different future is possible. And it's been great to see that the government has responded to this, calling for a new golden age of cycling. And they've backed that up quickly with funding for experimental schemes, as well as new policies to help guide uh, safe and uh, useful cycling infrastructure. Here in Cambridge, our first scheme to go in uh, was the Mill Road Bridge, and this is an experimental temporary traffic uh, filter implemented through the use of a bus gate. With all of this, it's important to remember that this isn't about closing roads to cars. This is about opening our roads and our public spaces to people, whatever form of transport they are using. 
If you'd like to help us, you can support our work by becoming a member, a corporate supporter, supporting or hosting an event. You can advertise in our magazine or donate. If you'd like to help CamCycle while we help shape our community, perhaps you'd like to consider becoming a trustee as well. Thank you for your time and uh, happy cycling. Okay. That's all of them. Um. I go, we can't hear you. I think you're on mute. Or is it John? Sorry, once I've started sharing, I couldn't unmute myself anymore. Zoom is <laughs> funny this way. Um, can everybody hear and see my slide now? Yes. Brilliant. So what, what I will just say is that because of this, give me 10 seconds, I need to find everybody so I can see what everybody else is doing. But um, if I may, I'd like to kick out with the first quick question to John, our first presenter, about how does he envisage the role of the chief engineer or the systems leader in the context of this suburban and urban transportation? That's a great question. I think what it comes down to is having one or more people who you charge to have that helicopter view or systems leadership role. That they have that oversight, they can see how all the different bits are emerging and how they fit together and ensure that that system of systems perspective and the challenges that come when you connect things together and uh, sort of the loss of common desire or in terms of common requirements and what you're trying to do don't get lost. So when, when you see what happens in Rolls-Royce, so there's a chief engineer for each engine that they produce. They couldn't design any particular part, but they have sufficient knowledge to know how all those parts should fit together and what good looks like in the context of the whole. And that is then filtered back down to the individual teams to make sure whatever they produce with whatever interfaces all comes together in one place and is fit for its intended purpose. So it might be it's a team of people rather than just one person who takes on that role. Thank you. Um, are there any other pressing questions for the plenary? I cannot see any raised hands or further questions. Is the oh sorry, Roxanne, you had a question. Go ahead. Yes, um, I suppose it's it's a response to Sean's presentation, uh, which I found quite surprising that you said cycling is not sufficiently per pervasive. Um, to become a, a mass form of transportation, particularly considering part of your business is, is an e-bike program. Um, cycling actually does help the elderly and the infirm to be more mobile, often more than cars. Um, you can have adapted cycles, you have electric cycles that help people who maybe can't walk as far or who are no longer able to hold a driving license. Um, so I was just very, very surprised that you'd put those points forward, particularly because that supports your own business model. Um, and we can see already from places like the Netherlands that they have mass cycling, that it is, um, it is at that level of transport that you're saying it can't reach. Sean, would you like to unmute yourself? Roxanne, there's no doubt that uh, you and I are on the same page in, in terms of um, cycling being inclusive and so on. We want to, uh, you know, promote it as much as possible. But, um, you know, what we're trying to achieve with the, the city part is to extend cycling to make it more inclusive uh, by, the, by virtue of making it weatherproof, uh, by making it stable for the infirm. Um, and, and uh, you know, to increase safety factors related to a cell-like, um, you know, construction. Um, so the one does not exclude the other. I mean, uh, you know, certainly we, we just see the city part as extending, um, you know, extending cycling to a, a whole new uh, range of users. Okay, so it's an extension to cycling, not an instead of. Um, I must say, as a campaigner, I do hope you can refine that messaging slightly because it, it may be interpreted that cycling is not a sufficient mode yeah, of travel. Okay, sure. Uh, Thank you very much, both. Um, we have another about half an hour to be able to dive into various discussions. So um, I, I will just share a screen in a second to show you some of the initial questions that we might want to share uh, in our groups. You'll be assigned to one of the groups and one of us organizers will be in each of those groups to help facilitate 
and take record of what's going on in the discussions. 